All right. Hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I'm delighted to be joined by Ken London, who is in the Windy City in Chicago. How are you doing, Ken? Oh, I'm fantastic. I think it's cold here. Yeah, cold and windy, probably. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Atlanta's a little hotter than this, so it's all right. Yeah, yeah. So Atlanta's where Ken normally is. Um, and and Ken is the president of Ken London and Associates, and he says the world of sales consulting is broken, broken um, with a traditional focus on what they deliver rather than how it impacts your company. And today, and this is an interesting topic given the fact that I used to run a sales training consultancy, why sales training won't fix your sales force? All right. So Ken, why won't it? <laughs> well, it's, I mean, it's obvious, right? It's a broken model. Just look at Years and years and years ago, the Effingham Forgetting Curve says that salespeople, they actually don't say salespeople, they say anybody, forget 77% of what they actually are taught or learn within the first seven days after a program is delivered. So this mm -hmm. idea that we can come in once a quarter or once a year and go, oh, hey, fix my salespeople, it's just a bad idea. And there's no, statistically, it makes absolutely no sense. So companies are throwing away billions of dollars a year doing this. And it's... You know, I just think it's one of those things that you just let's start paying attention to whether or not that you're getting an ROI on what you spend spend with your money. Yeah, no, I'd have to agree with you because uh, back when I was running Hathaway, which is uh, spin selling, uh, that was that was the always the issue about when companies look at sales performance improvement as an event rather than an ongoing process. Yeah. And often, what would happen, as you know, is they would say. Oh, well, we're going to bring you in. Uh, and why are you bringing us in? Well, we, we did Miller Hyman or somebody else a, a yeah. year or two ago, but that didn't work. Yeah, Miller and, Hyman and it always, doesn't work. Yeah. And I always thought, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, and I wonder why it didn't work because you never, you never, you never adopted it and put it into the DNA of how you operate. So, what is, what is the, what, is, how do you, when you engage with a company, what do you do differently to make sure that this is, that this uh, situation isn't repeated? Oh, goodness. That's a fantastic question. Well, we changed the model completely, right? And so the way that we change the models, it's not that training isn't important, mm -hmm. right? You'd be silly to say that coaching, managing, yeah. training are not all important aspects of running a sales force. But what we do is we'll give bite-sized pieces, reinforce the change behavior with coaching, field sales guys for management, whatever it has, and then we'll introduce a, another bite-sized piece. And so we do this kind of habit stacking, for lack of a better phrase, process that we engage with over the course of an entire year. So we're sitting in Chicago right now because I was developing that program with one of our clients for their sales force of about 70 people and, and 18 managers. So we're launching a 12 month, let's make sure that we get behavior change as opposed to let's just show up. I mean, I know when you ran your company and you were doing sales training, right? It was one of those things where you're like, okay, I'm gonna go do it because I'm really good at it. I really hope that this that can have an impact on this company, the sales force and the management. But then often it was disappointing. And so we work with companies who say, you know what, we're tired of that model and we want to actually see our sales force, our management transform. So um, I don't know, I'm interested, what, what's your take on that? No, no, I, 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 no I, I agree with you because um, that, that was always the issue and it didn't matter whether they signed up for additional coaching over time or whatever is, is that unless you have the this the leadership of the organization has to be 100 committed to it and then this then the sales leadership has to reinforce it on a daily basis so it's no good if you go in and train people and with all the greatest will in the world if the sales manager never reinforces the, the performance uh, improvements skills or whatever you're trying to teach if they don't enforce it then it just becomes uh initiative du jour yeah. And, uh, and they, and, you know, any good salesperson, any good employee knows, uh, well, yeah, they rolled out that initiative, but if my manager is not talking to me about it, or he doesn't seem to care about it, well, then I don't care about it either. Yeah, let's just, what the, here's exactly what they're thinking. Look, the wind is blowing really hard, yeah. but that will change, and then I can just do what I've always done. Yeah. Yeah. So I think you're right. Absolutely. You're right about the thing is that you have to, you have to be engaged for, a, for a, a period of a long period of time, a decent period of time. And I like your approach about doing what did you call that? I wrote that down habit stacking. Yeah, habit yeah. stacking. I like that idea a lot. Because to your point is, you know, people, 
Uh, and, and we used to say, I think the retention rate was even less than that. It was like 80 something percent of, of was forgotten after a year, yeah. after three weeks. But I think, I think this is it. People are distracted. People are, feel overwhelmed. So I think that your approach in bite sizes is a good one. Yeah, well, thanks. And I think the idea of this too is let's think about what we're here to do. Mm -hmm. The reason somebody in, the reason somebody comes and says, hey, Ken, bring your team in is because they actually want to see behavior change. Yep. They, they're not, they're, that's what they're paying us for because they've said our sales management leadership has been unable to do that. And so they're saying, Ken, please come in and give us behavior change. And so all we've done is simply match the model to something that we think can be effective in providing those outcomes and lifting sales revenues and results. So, um, you know, it's one of those things where that's why I think the world of sales training is broken. And it's not working now it's making there's and, and some of those trainers are the best you'll ever see oh yeah but that's oh, irrelevant yeah. because they're not the people within the organization have to want to change it they've got to have field guides for managers and the things that will allow reinforcement which just aren't being done and here's why it's super simple they've all got day jobs <laughs> they, yeah. what can, you want us to add stuff you know i mean mm -hmm. th that's how it went i'm sure that's i'm sure that hasn't changed since when you had your when you had your firm uh, no, no, and uh, no, not at all. And I think that's the the key point to it. There, as you said, is they have day jobs, so it's very tempting when you come in to do an initiative with the company that it's so important to you that you want it to be as important to the other people. And it yeah. may be on some level, but as you say, there's a day job, and when the day job gets in the way, what's the first thing that's going to get jettisoned? Yeah, the new stuff, the strategy, the the behavior change. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and we think, just we know that to be true. Go ahead. Yeah, no, I was going to say, and I think that's a really important uh, clarification here for people. Um, you can train people. That's fine. And, and training is part of it. But you can discreetly train people if that's what you want to do. But behavior change is not something that can be that can happen just with training. As Ken is pointing out, this is a long term process. And believe it or not, this may surprise you. People don't like to change. <laughs> so it so it's a process yeah no it's totally true because here's the deal and I, the look i do I, with bodybuild i work out whatever but it doesn't mm -hmm. matter never once judged anybody for whether they choose to do that what i can tell you is this right if you look at the world i don't care you choose to be happy but nobody will say that if you're overweight that's good for your health mm -hmm. right and it's super hard for us to just even change those things that have much more dire impact on us as a human could cause death, diabetes, cancer, but we still won't make those changes because we just crave homeostasis, right? We crave just, just give me normalcy in my day. It's super, super hard. So I don't, I don't know. How would you go about making change for people? Um, but I, th I think, I think you're, I think you're on the right track there. I think with what you call is the habit stacking, because I think, people can bite off small changes and as long as they're reinforced and reinforced and they realize and they can see the benefit of them relatively quickly i think the minute people start to feel overwhelmed or that it's too much they just go into shutdown mode and and back to your analogy there i think that's what happens to a lot of people is you know they say okay i want to get in shape so what do they do they they buy a new pair of sneakers and they say i'm going to go out running today right and they go out and they run a couple of miles and they come home and they're everything aches and they're exhausted and everything they'd actually be better off going for a 10 minute walk yes. uh, first time and doing it from there so i think that's why i think that's why your your approach is the correct one because i think sometimes yeah. I think people go try to go from A to Z instead of realizing the baby steps. Yeah, all or nothing, all or nothing. You know, it's like I've posted some stuff on LinkedIn about some of the workouts we do because I think that actually coincides incredibly well with what biz, the world of business is about. And like, we'll make, I'll make a 2% heavier best of all time and celebrate the heck out of that. Right. And in sales, particularly now, we're like, if I can't go from being an SDR to the vice president of the company in 18 months, my career is moving too slow. Like yeah. it's goal setting. It's do the little things, do the things that matter. And those little changes in habits, it's exponential. The impact it'll have on your life over time. Yeah, I don't know. I totally agree. And I think the other thing too, is that, and this is certainly something that I discovered back when I was uh, with Hothway to, uh, was that, uh, and this is often the case when you have experienced salespeople, and I'm sure you've come across this a lot of times, is uh, they have 
they have sometimes some of them will have forgotten the fundamentals and have developed bad habits over time. And we all yeah. do that. And you say, you know, sure. you're you're a bodybuilder. I do martial arts. And sometimes, mm -hmm. you know, we spend sometimes our master will come in and we'll spend the whole class doing the basics that you learned all the way back, like me, like whatever, 15 years ago or something. And there's always something to be corrected. Because yeah, it's we so because we sorry. we get focused on on where we're, we're yeah. advanced now, you know, we're experienced. Yeah. yeah, it's so silly. Like, pick one of the best athletes you know in the sport they do. So let's just take basketball as an example. Okay, I'm not going to get into the Michael Jordan LeBron debate. Mm -hmm. Okay, so everybody who's ready to <laughs> attack me for this, chill out for a second. But pick either of them, right? Before they were big enough to actually be able to take a ball and shoot it ten feet into the air into a hoop, what did they do? They dribbled. What do they do now as the best in the world? Michael Jordan obviously retired. They start every practice dribbling. Somehow in sales, we don't think we have to do any of the stuff that we did that started to make us good. And yeah. then we forget it. And we wonder why we can't build pipeline. We wonder why nobody wants to talk to us. We wonder why we can't stay customer centric in our conversation. So yeah, you're so right. Like go back, do the basics peeps. Yeah, I mean, it, it sticks on the basketball for a moment. Uh, you know, we were hearing a story a while back of the late Kobe Bryant. And, you know, obviously, you know, one of the greatest basketball players uh, ever. He apparently he used to show up in the gym earlier than anybody else, like about 5 a.m. in the morning. And you would think that he was practicing trick shots and shots. from. He practiced the basic drills he learned in high school. That's what yeah. he used to do for the first hour or two every day. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Think about the here's the role of sales, right? It's one of the few professions in the world that has such an impact on a company that requires yeah. no continuing ed. Mm. I mean, that's very true. It's the only, you know, you go, are you kidding me? The face of your organization is driving revenue, and we're not finding ways to make sure that they are stay up to date on their basic skills and that they continue to advance as a profession. Well, yeah, because let's face it. I mean, the uh, the majority of people who start off in sales that wasn't their that wasn't their plan. In fact, yeah, um, yeah. it's it's a very interesting statistic. Is like you have all these colleges with, um, you know, marketing programs. Uh, so everybody goes in. Oh, I'm going to be a marketer, but they come out and they discover well, they're less marketing jobs, so they all end up as salespeople uh, <laughs> yeah. in their first job. And, and, and to your point, like there's been no there's been no training, there's been no education at all. And I think, and then in some companies, they just do, as you said, I mean, they'll put you through maybe their road training or whatever, and then away you go. So what you're doing here is changing that paradigm. Yeah, we're, we're certainly trying to. And I can tell you that just from where we sit, the market acceptance of the way that we're coming to it, because it's outcome based, you know, it's because it is, hey, we're really trying to change it. And because when you look at costs, they're all comparable, but the outcome has become better. Um, you know, I'm, we're hopeful, you know, we, we're hopeful. Mm -hmm. We think that we'll continue to continue this trend of people really loving uh, what we're able to do for them, how we're able to place those outcomes. But I just, let's get back to the basic premise, right? The basic premise, John, was this. You can't just throw t two days of sales training at your people and assume that you've fixed your problem. And it's mm -hmm. almost unfair to do that just so that you can then say to the VP of sales, the CEO or the CRO that you, oh, it's just them or it's those yeah. programs like mm -hmm. lead the people own it yeah because basically what you just said there is yeah you're just giving yourself two get out of jail cards you can either blame the people or you can blame the program uh instead of as you said instead of looking at yourself uh so when you work with people tell me what are some of the what are some of the experiences you've had with people going through this behavior change and then realizing that it the accumulative uh, the cumulative change that's happening and how it's really impacting uh, the organization yeah i can give you some specific examples so you know one of my clients i've got a sales rep who we've been coaching now for four years within this process we've been working with their entire team but i'll give you a specific mm -hmm. individual example right so um we we met the we met this individual. They hadn't uh, they hadn't sold a single deal. They were six months into their time. It's an enterprise sale, right? So they're selling to top one thousand, Fortune one thousand accounts. Hadn't sold anything. A base salary of sixty five thousand. Um, right. We were able to work with them. How do you prospect? How do you do, how do you do more value discovery? We were able to stack these habits. How do you have better customer centric conversations? Two years later, their income their income uh, approached and surpassed actually three hundred fifty thousand dollars. Wow. So. 
And that's based on their contribution of over $12 million in sales to the company at great margins. So that's just kind of an, impact, an idea of the type of impact that you can make if you'll stop accepting that the status quo is the only way to fix the problem, right? It's, it just doesn't make sense. So that path we've repeated over and over and over again in various degrees with many, many different sales organizations. And what's awesome about it is how it frees up the company because sales puts enough pressure, pressure on the rest of the company to become operationally efficient. Mm -hmm. And think about how we've changed those people's lives, those salespeople. We've, spouses have been able to come home from work and raise their children. They've been able to enjoy things they've never been able to, and they have a freedom. So uh, it's, it's really, really fulfilling to connect at the personal level with those stories too. Yeah, no, hundred uh, percent. And and you know, sales is the heart is the most difficult job. And as you say, it's the point of the spear. It's the uh, is the part that interfaces with the with the market in, in many ways first, and sometimes like the only interaction that a lot of people have um, with your organization. So it's criti It's critically important um, to give them the support. But I think the part here that I think is really good, Ken, is that you're providing the ongoing support because I can imagine yeah. there, you know, there are people who will go through training, they really want to do well and they really want to implement these things and they really want to make a change. But as you said, their day job gets in the way and then they kind of are left feeling that they're on their own. Yeah. So I think the yeah. critical part is that ongoing support and the independent and ongoing support from you as well as their manager. Yeah, and I think the other thing too that is, the other thing that really sets apart the idea of this. So we talked about the small incremental change in order to have it stacked to see behaviors get modified. But here's the really big part. You can have the best sales training in the world with the best sales coaching in a bad sales process with bad go-to-market and, the, and the, the effect will be nullified. And mm -hmm. so one of the really cool things, what we've said is we've said, you don't buy sales training from us. You get what, we'll, you, get what you need. So in that process, while we're helping train, this, train, this, train the sales force, we're working with the sales management to improve their skills, to manage the sales force and drive revenue in a leadership capacity. And then we're advising on, hey, where are the sticking points within the sales process? So that holistic outlook makes it so that you're not just changing one wheel on your vehicle when you've got four wheels that are flat. Um, and so I just think that's something that's really cool about it. No, and I think that's, uh, again, I think you that's something that's extremely uh, critical because a lot of organizations, you know, if they have a sale, if they have a sales process uh, and you ask them, they say, well, you know, how often do you review your sales process? And they say, oh, our sales process. I don't know. I don't know. And who created it? Oh, I think that was... Yeah. Ken, who was here, he was here a few years yeah. ago. He was like VP of yeah. sales. I think he created it. And you're like going, well, there's your first issue. Sales processes are dynamic. They should always, you should always be looking at them uh, and tweaking them as things change. Yeah. You know, and I think what's interesting about sales process. So here's something. So for everybody who's listening to this, you may not be in a billion dollar company and may not be in the big companies, right? And you're going, geez, I wish I could get my sales process right. Just know this. So I've been in we you know, we have clients from 2 million to, you know, we've done work with clients that have done $150 billion. Mm -hmm. Here's the deal. All those big companies are broken too. They don't have the sales process figured out. And one of the big reasons, John, is because they haven't readdressed what's happening in that thing. And so it, it's so interesting to go in and, and you start to ask people when they will give you the real information, hey, how do you follow the sales process? We were in an organization with 600 sales sales reps last year, and they said, "What sales process?" Yeah, I was like, "You got to be kidding me!" And but it's the exact same comment that you get from a, a company who's at two million, who's post post revenue, you know, that's looking to kind of scale. So you, you know, the, when you're smaller, like lean into this stuff, so you don't have to deal with this stuff after your success has already come to you. Yeah. And by the way, if you want to do a little bit of research on it, you'll find that there's research out there from McKinsey and other people that will that that show that the top performing or sales organizations in the world, they have a defined sales process. Yeah. And within each stage of that process, they have defined defined activities that need to happen and they enforce it, which is yep. the most important part. Yeah, if you don't enforce it, then you don't know. Like you're looking to go, hey, this percentage, we have this percentage to close yeah. for forecast. So here's the other thing. Part of the way that you can enforce it is too, just a quick little trick for people who are listening, have clear exit gates for each stage mm -hmm. of the sales yep. process and then have clear retracement steps 
for when something doesn't happen and a deal starts to fall off. And those two things will absolutely help tighten up what you can forecast with. Yeah, absolutely. And then you'll get away from that uh, situation where you have you have Ken and John have identical uh, opportunities with identical characteristics. And Ken has it in stage four and John has it in stage two. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. How do you do that? How do you forecast that? I mean, let's because let's think about it. If we want to grow revenue and we want to grow in a systematic, sustainable way, then we may, we need to be able to forecast like it's too many companies are sitting around and you're going, what are you going to get? What's, what's the number going to be at the end of the quarter? And they're going, well, you know, I think he's got four deals. They got six. Yeah. Could be about, you know, I don't know, 10 deals. I mean, how do you yeah. forecast and grow a company that way? No, you can't. And, and especially nowadays, you, you just can't do that anymore. Not that you ever really could, but I think particularly now. Well, listen, Ken, this has been fantastic. Thank you so much for joining us today. All of Ken's information is going to be below this video, the links to, to find out more. But before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about yourself and what you do. Oh, sure. It's, it's, it's pretty simple. I'm president of Ken Lundy and Associates. You've heard a little bit about us. We you know, do sales consulting. We work with B2B brands, no, no B2C, and everywhere from sales leadership down to the rep. Um, but you can get a hold of me. I'd certainly say, you know, go on LinkedIn, look up Ken Lundin, L-U-N-D-I-N, you'll see it. And then just put in there when you connect with me that you saw me on John's show and that we were on Sales Pop together, and I'd be glad to connect with you. Fantastic. Well, listen, uh, Ken, again, uh, great work you're doing. Uh, a great information, great insight. I would really encourage people to check it out. And I would encourage you, if you have a sales organization, check out the work that Ken is doing. My name is John Golden, Sales Pop Online, Sales Magazine, Pipeliner CRM. See you all for another interview really soon. Thank you.